Hello there guys, so a couple months ago I went down to the, the far distant land of, uh, of Florida and while I was there I did lots and lots of birding because it might not be that surprising that there's a lot of birds that live in Florida that you could not find in Washington state. It was also my first time birding in another state so that was also cool, quite the, quite the state to go to for the second state to bird in. I was there from the end of March to the very beginning of April and so there were lots and lots of wintering birds that were still there but because of the timing some of them were still in their winter plumage some were molting into their summer breeding plumage kind of varied but yeah I had a super amazing time I saw lots and lots of bird species lots and lots of new bird species and I of course filmed my whole experience and so here is the video of that experience and I hope you all enjoy. One of the most common species that was in the area was the brown pelican. This right here is a juvenile. These birds are pretty much everywhere that you could find water and access to the ocean, which was pretty much everywhere that I was hanging out. So I saw a lot of these birds. There was also quite a few adults uh, that were hanging out on this mangrove platform. Up here in Washington, I'm not that used to seeing big birds. It feels like most of the stuff that we have is pretty small. So seeing so many pelicans, which are very large birds, just everywhere was pretty cool. Next up we have a willet, a relative of the yellow legs that was hanging out on this beach. Pretty much every beach that we went to had at least one willet hanging out on it. They were fairly common and seemed to be pretty tolerant of people. And this individual here is clearly doing some foraging, actually in the waves. It was going into the water quite a bit, as well as running away from them like a sanderling. This little bird right here is a winter plumage ruddy turnstone. They have that name because they like to use their bill to flip over stones and shells and stuff to get any food items underneath. This particular individual was not doing that because there wasn't really any stones big enough to flip over on this beach, but I assure you, you can look at videos that they, that's something that they do. And then here we have a singular sanderling that was also running on the beach next to the turnstones and the willet. Sanderlings are a pretty common shorebird species and are famous as being little ones that will run into the waves as they go away and then run away from the waves as they come back up. They're very pale white in their non-breeding plumage, but once they molt into their breeding plumage, they're a much more red rusty color, which is quite the transformation. Since filming this video, both the turnstone and the sanderling will since have migrated all the way up to the high arctic where they breed. When we got back from the beach that day, we saw this great egret that was hanging out there. And as you can see, he was kind of having a, a bad feather day on his head. The next day I went to Fort DeSoto Park, which I would say was probably the most productive day of the trip. I saw a lot of bird species there, including a lot of osprey. I found the osprey to be very, very common down in Florida and they had lots and lots of nesting platforms for them, as well as they were always flying around in the air. We have osprey up here in Washington, but they're nowhere near that common. While I was up there, I also got a flyby by a white ibis. There were also some northern mockingbirds that were hanging out there. Northern mockingbirds, if you couldn't tell by the name, mimic the, the sounds of other bird species and that's kind of how they, they show off to their potential mates. That's how they sing, by showing, look at all these different sounds I can make. There was also a pair of loggerhead shrikes there, which I was super excited to see. Just the whole concept of a predatory songbird is just really cool to me. But then, while I was there, I also saw uh, and heard some other birds that were flying around. A non-native bird species, but a cool one nonetheless, the Nanday parakeets. Going down there, I was expecting to see parrots because I knew Florida had non-native parrot species, but I was not expecting there to be such a sizable population. I mean, like, there were parrots at this park, but I think I saw parrots basically every day. Nanday parakeets are definitely a very common sight to see in St. Petersburg, Florida. As I was saying, they are a non-native species. There are no native species of parrot to the United States. The only parrot that did have a substantial population in the United States was the Carolina parakeet, which is now extinct, of course. They're native to Southern Brazil and Paraguay, but now they have a very substantial population 
kind of throughout several cities in Florida, as well as Los Angeles and California. These birds also seemed at least to be pretty fond of foraging on the ground. They were eating a lot of grass, I guess, and other stuff that was in this field that they were hanging out in. But they have such pretty colors. I mean, that green is just so green and the blue and then they're red on their legs. It just looks so cool. These are the only birds that I have seen that have like this grass color green to them. And that made them really stand out and they're just so pretty. They were also very loud. I'll, I'll play a clip here just kind of show some of the sounds that they were making. They're making those sounds all the time, but it did make them very easy to find because there's not really another bird that's in the region that sounds like that. These were one of the target species I wanted to see in Florida. I was so excited when I finally got to see them and I spent a lot of time just watching them go about and, and do their thing. I've seen parrots before, but they've always been in captivity. These were the first ones I saw that were just wild, that no one owned them. They were just flying around, hanging out. I mean, they were in human uh, settings pretty much all the time because that's where they were hanging out. But, you know, they were living just like a wild crow or raccoon or something like that would. Definitely one of the highlights of the trip. It was also fun watching this dude just give up on the fact that it had wings and decide to crawl up this tree with just its feet and beak. I guess he wanted to do it for the thrill and fun of it maybe or I, I don't know what was going on in his brain but it was very interesting to watch. He was like a wanting to be a squirrel or something. They also had crows there but they did not have American crows, they had fish crows which you can tell this is a fish crow by its call. It's a lot more nasally than a normal crow. But the call is basically what you can use to identify the two different species. They look and act pretty much identical to each other. There was also this osprey who was just chilling out in the water because why not? And then I saw a common ground dove and this dude was so tiny. Like I thought our morning doves were like on the smaller sides of pigeons, but this dude was like a little sparrow thing almost. But these here are not doves. These are a pair of white ibis that I saw going about one of the more foresty regions. A really striking colored bird with that red head that really stands out against, against the white body. I also saw a dolphin that was swimming about the, the, I don't know, ocean lagoon area that I was at, which was pretty darn cool to see. Dolphins are very cool animals. Speaking of cool animals, I also got to see the brown pelicans doing their cool diving behavior. This behavior is unique to brown pelicans and their close relative, the Peruvian pelican. And they have a bunch of adaptations that allow them to do this high speed dive. One of them is that some of their air sacs have evolved to basically be right underneath their skin. And right before impact, they inhale, fill up this air sac and it acts as bubble wrap that helps cushion them upon impact. They also do other things such as turning to the left. Their trachea is on the right side of their neck and this turning to the left makes it so that those do not bear the brunt of impact. I think these two adaptations that they have that allow them to do this behavior are really, really neat. Here we got a snowy egret trying to mlaunch on a shell, a very small egret heron species. I was not expecting them to be as small as they were. Uh, but definitely very easy to distinguish from the great egret due to the size. Speaking of the great egret, there was also one of these big boys that was hanging out at the place, a lot closer in size to a great blue heron, which is in the same genus as. Herons I think are really interesting to me because it seems like there's a lot of white ones, but the white ones are not all in like the same group. Like they seem to independently evolve to be white multiple times, which I guess does make sense because there are quite a few heron species that have both a white and a non-white morph. So I guess it's just whenever the population dynamic makes it so that the white morph kind of takes over, but I still think it's pretty interesting. After looking at the egrets, I decided to move out to the beach where there was a whole bunch of shorebird species, including these winter plumage dunlin right here, as well as this sanderling that was also hanging about in this little streamy tide spot. 
Here's another up close shot at a Dunlin as it goes about doing its feeding for invertebrates stuff. Farther into the tide pool, there was another snowy egret that was going about hunting for fish as well as this willet and a sanderling that just ran by in the background. There goes another sanderling. There were also these least sandpiper, which are so small. I could not believe that they're like sparrow sized. It's crazy and they're so cute. I mean, just look at that thing. And it's just, they're adorable. They were great fun to watch going about their their business in large part just because I just was constantly amazed at just how small they were. There were also some American oyster catcher that were hanging out across the beach. Very distinctive from the black oyster catcher in the sense that these ones have white on them as opposed to just being black. That's, that's kind of how you tell them apart. Here is a black-bellied plover. You might be questioning the origins of its name, given that it's not got, it doesn't have a black belly, but I assure you in the breeding plumage, they do have a black belly. This dude is just in his non-breeding plumage. Here are some royal terns that were taking a bath in this giant tide pool. Here's a little better view of the American Oyster Catcher, and you can see that this one also has bands on its legs, like the Black Oyster Catcher that I saw back in Washington in the last video. I don't know what's up with me and seeing banded oyster catchers, but I guess it's just my thing. This is not an oyster catcher though, this is a marbled godwit. I really like the look of these dudes, I love the barring on the back. I think the pink bill really really add something to the coloration though it really fits with them there were several of them here and they were all you know going about sticking their bill deep into that mud to get all those juicy invertebrates that were undoubtedly hiding within it i also saw these two sanderlings get into a fight i didn't catch them actually fighting in the video but you can see they're having a standoff it is so adorable to watch these two tiny birds be so pissed off at each other it's, it's just, I love it. It's, it's just amazing. And then eventually, one of them decides to give up, and his solution to that is just like cowering down on the ground because he can't handle the mere presence, the power emanating from the dude on the right. He's just, it's, it's too much for his tiny little sanderling body to handle, and he collapses on the ground. And look at the winner as he shuffles away. He looks so shady. He knows he didn't deserve to win that fight. There were several semi-palmated plover that were hanging out about the thing. Those guys look kind of like killdeer, but they only got one band on their neck as opposed to two, and they're also smaller than killdeer. And that's kind of how, that's the main way you can tell them apart. It was like watching little baby killdeer, and it was fun. This is another plover species known as the Wilson's plover. This one looks very similar to the semi-palmated, but it's got a bigger bill and also slightly larger. And that's how you can tell this dude apart. But get this, there was a fourth plover species hanging about. This one is the snowy plover, which as you can see is very similar to the semi-palmated, but is much, much lighter in color. Moving on from the beaches of Fort DeSoto, we are now on the Chaza Howitzka River. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. And there were some black vultures that were chilling out there. New species for me, we only have turkey vultures up here in Washington State. And these dudes were eating a dead gar. That was crazy to see. I don't think I've, I think this might be my first time ever seeing a gar. I mean, it was dead, but you know. <laughs> better than nothing. These dudes were going to town on it and it was super fun to watch as they ate this fish because I don't, I've never seen vultures eat fish before. There was also this gray catbird that was knocking about, a species that we do get up here in Washington, but only in the summer. So it was very neat to see this dude hanging out in the late winter, early springtime. We do not get this bird up here in Washington though. This is the tricolored heron because he's got three main colors to him, and that's how he got his name. It's very creative. And this one is the Little Blue Heron. It's like the Great Blue Heron, but it's little, and it's more closely related to the Snowy Egret, because taxonomy. There were also several Anhanga that were hanging out about the river. This was one that was sunning its feathers up on a branch. 
And then this was my first ever wood duck I gotta see, and oh my gosh, it's so pretty! I would, I, like, I knew they were pretty, but this dude was so pretty! It was so fun to watch. We do get them up here in Washington, but I just hadn't seen them at the time. I've, I've since seen wood ducks in Washington since this, but these are my first wood ducks I've ever seen, and I had a great time watching them foraging in the river. This is a few days later at the place I was staying at, and I got some footage of this magnificent frigate bird that was soaring about the waves over the ocean. The ocean is that way. You just, you can't tell because I didn't get the camera angle right. Uh, but also at the place I was staying was a black crowned night heron who liked to sleep in the tree during the day because these guys are nocturnal. He was definitely a treat to get to watch. He was very tolerant of humans and so I was able to get some nice up close views. I also saw this red bellied woodpecker that was going about pecking at this palm tree. I never thought I would say that sentence but you know here we are. I then ended up going to this pier that was in the city and they had boat-tailed grackles there. Boat-tailed grackles are pretty much only found along the Atlantic coast. They have a very, very narrow range of inhabitants. So I was very happy to get this species marked off my life list. There was also a green heron that was hanging out there. If I thought the snowy eager was small, this dude was even more shocking. It was like the size of a crow. It such a small heron. It's so adorable. There were also some double crested cormorants that were hanging about the pier. As well as some Eurasian collared doves. But then this dude was really exciting to see. This is a mallard model duck hybrid. So these hybrids are actually very common in the Tampa Bay region. They're kind of a, a Tampa Bay is kind of a big center for the hybrid zone. Unfortunately, basically no uh, native model duck purebreds left in the region. They've all kind of been genetically drowned by the introduced mallards. Here's another hybrid, although less distinctive looking. You can tell it's a hybrid though by the presence of white in the tail feathers, curling in the tail feathers, and black on the rump. All features that purebred model ducks do not possess. As well as the fact that he also has some streaking on his cheeks, another feature that purebreds do not possess either. They were definitely pretty cool to see, but they, you know, mixed feelings about them because it's like, oh, you're cool, but at the same time, you're kind of replacing a native species. So, yeah. I also saw my first ever prairie warbler that was jumping about in these trees right there. The final spot that I went to was the Boyd Nature Preserve. And there they had a whole bunch of injured raptors that they had in these cages for the public to see. All of them had some form of injury that made it so that they could not be released back into the wild. All their injuries seemed to be pretty minor, at the very least uh, as far as how it affected their appearance, with the exception of this red-shouldered hawk who was missing an eyeball. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but I don't think it had a good time that day is all I will say. They also had a Kara Kara there, which it was definitely different to see. We do not have those in Washington. Uh, and that was a real, real treat to get to watch. Moving past the raptors, I saw this female cardinal that was whacking a caterpillar to death so that she could consume it. There were also Nande parakeets there, which I think as I discussed before was not unique to this region. I also got to see my first ever blue-gray gnat catcher that was hanging about in top of this tree here. Not the best views of it, but definitely distinctly a blue-gray gnat catcher. When I moved to more of the wetland area, I saw this statue mimicking Great Blue Heron as it was hunting for fish and trying not to be seen by me, doing a very, very good statue impression. I would have given him money if it was a dude standing on the street. There were also common gallinules in this wetland type environment and their close relative, the American coot, as well as a pied-billed grebe. These two are like the lobe-footed 
uh, brothers because these guys both have lobed feet, just really wide toes, as opposed to actually having webbed feet for swimming, though they are not actually closely related. Very neat to get to see these two species just chilling out with each other though. There was also another anhanga that was hiding in the bushes, as well as many blue jays that were up in the trees. This was a Forster's Tern that was flying about the marshy habitat as well. Another, another cool bird to see. And this is a belted kingfisher doing his best hummingbird impression as he tries to zero in on a fish below him by hovering in the air. This bird was not moving at all. I could not believe the immense amount of skill that this bird was using to stay in this one spot. I was, I was really impressed. Good job, Belted Kingfisher. You're a, more skilled than I could ever be. And, because we were in a wetland in Florida, there were also alligators. But anyways, to wrap up the video now, I had a really great time in Florida. I saw lots and lots of bir new bird species, so many new bird species. Hopefully I'll be able to go back to Florida one day. And when I do, I will hopefully see many more new bird species that if I'm still filming birds by then, I might put a YouTube video up. Or maybe not. Who knows? It will be in the future. I can't predict the future. But at any rate, I wish you guys all a great day. Hope you enjoyed the video and happy 4th of July. Adios.